Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Sweet, and welcome to Cross-Platform Pitfalls and How to Avoid Them. I hope you can all hear me all right. I pre-recorded the content for this talk, so I'm going to be playing that back in this session, and I'll also be monitoring the Q&A throughout to respond in line to shorter questions, and then I can also pause the video and respond to questions live in bulk, kind of periodically to make it more conversational. So please do uh, share any questions that you have via the Q&A, and we can incorporate it as part of this presentation. So. With that, I think a few folks might still be coming in, but I will go ahead and start the pre-recorded content. And again, please use both the chat and the Q&A functionality, and we can make this a bit more conversational and interactive for you. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Sweet. I use she, her pronouns, and this is Cross-Platform Pitfalls and How to Avoid Them. If you saw me give this talk at CPPCon last September, then I think you will still find value in my presentation today. This talk will be following the same format, but the content and demos have all been updated to showcase recent developments, like CMake's CMakePresets.json file. Tooling for C++ cross-platform developers is a fractured solution space. And to help illustrate this, I'm going to start with an example rooted in combinatorics. So let's say that I'm a C++ developer working on an application that needs to run on both Windows and Linux. So I want to choose one cross-platform build system generator out of 10. I want to choose two package management solutions out of six because I think I want to use the system package manager on Linux, which means I'll need to figure something else out on Windows. I want to choose two IDEs or editors out of eight. Maybe folks on my team have different preferences or maybe I'm opting for platform specific solutions. I want to choose one cross-platform unit testing framework out of 10. And I want to choose one continuous integration system out of four. Now, obviously, this is just an example with arbitrary coefficients and restraints that I've imposed, but already we're up to 168,000 unique combinations of tools that I can choose from. As a cross-platform developer who uses these tools, this offers a lot of flexibility, but it can also make your life difficult. It can be harder to get started because there's simultaneously too much documentation to sift through and no authoritative source of truth on the workflow that you're actually trying to accomplish. It can be harder to find and leverage the work of others. And generally, it makes it difficult to push the field towards a consensus of good practice. As someone who creates or contributes to these tools, it can also be frustrating because the overwhelming number of options makes it difficult for any one tool to achieve the critical mass necessary for a positive feedback loop of contributions. Now, I don't have all the answers, and I understand that your team's needs and matrix of solutions might be entirely unique. But as a part of my job, I do talk to cross-platform developers to better understand their workflows, their pain points, and the tools that they're using or want to use to help address these problems. In this talk, I'm going to synthesize some common problems and pitfalls that I hear real teams facing and offer commentary on the solution space rooted in widely adopted tools. So I've split this talk into three sections or stages in a development workflow, starting with build systems and build system generators, dependency management, and debugging. And a primary focus of this talk will be CMake's new CMakePresets.json file. I'll also be giving two demos to showcase some of the new developments that my team at Microsoft has been working on in the past few months. But if you're not using Visual Studio CMake support or VC package or VS Code or anything at all in the Microsoft ecosystem, then I think you will still find value in this talk today because the problems that I'll be talking about, whether it's with a build system generator or a continuous integration system, are transferable and not tied to just one IDE. So with that, I can hop on into the first section on build systems and build system generators. 
Normally, I'm going to start by synthesizing some common problems and pitfalls and then offer commentary on the solution space. But with this section, I'm going to first begin by differentiating between build systems and build system generators. A build system we can define as a tool or a set of tools used to compile and link source code. And oftentimes, these build systems will only run on a subset of operating systems. Some common examples include all the different flavors of make or build systems that are tied to an IDE, like Xcode and MS Build. To help address the problem of platform-specific build systems, we have build system generators which we can define as a tool or a set of tools used to generate project files for a specified build system. Build system generators allow you to maintain one build script or one source of truth when you're building for multiple platforms. And whether you love it or hate it, CMake leads the market as a cross-platform build system generator, which leads to something called the CMake network effect which is basically the idea that other tools, projects, libraries are more likely to be using CMake and integrate well with your own CMake projects. We've also seen more and more IDEs and editors adding their own support for CMake in a response to this effect. But even if you're using CMake or you know you want to use CMake, there's still a lot of ways that your life can be difficult. And that's what we're going to discuss next, CMake and the problems. One thing that I hear repeatedly from cross-platform developers is that it can be difficult to learn the language of the build system. This might be especially true if you're used to an IDE that helps to manage the underlying build system for you, like Visual Studio and MS Build. Relatively common actions, like adding a new source file to a project, need to be available to everyone, devs, testers, and not just your build architects who are your in-house CMake experts. But with really complicated build scripts, even adding a new source file to a target can become a non-trivial task. Finally, just like C++, CMake is its own language. So it's yet another set of best practices and syntax that you'll need to learn. Another potential pitfall is reproducing your CMake configuration and build among all the developers on your team who might be working on different platforms with different IDEs, editors from the command line, and reproducing your local build in a continuous integration system. Previously, all IDEs and editors had their own kind of CMake support. So two examples are CMake settings.json in Visual Studio and kits and variants files in Visual Studio Code. And both of these solutions are used to drive CMake configuration and build. This can make it harder for teams to hop between IDEs and editors, even if folks on their team have different preferences because they will need to create and maintain the configuration files that are specific to that environment. These configuration files also couldn't always be checked in because they might contain both user-specific specific information, like local builds and full paths, alongside project-specific information, like shared CMake variables. In the same vein, this could make it difficult to reproduce IDE builds from the CLI or in a continuous integration system. CMIG itself has no knowledge of these IDE-specific configuration files, which means that you're either going to need to duplicate all of the information that you provide in those configuration files to reconstruct the CMIG invocation and build, or you can have some IDE-specific solution that knows how to parse those files and reconstruct the command line. Finally, these team-level problems can manifest themselves in the open source community as well, because a lot of open source projects that build with CMake have very different build instructions. And I don't mean that they're just passing different arguments to CMake. I mean the procedural steps that you must take to generate C to call CMake and generate the build system are more or less involved. And a lot of this is due to project-specific setup scripts that are difficult to avoid. But there's room for more consensus in how we solve this common problem of documenting and sharing configure, build, and test options with others. But fortunately, CMake has been working on some developments recently that I think can really help streamline this. 
In CMIC 319, Kitmer released support for a file called cmigpresets.json. cmigpresets.json allows users to specify common configure options and share them with others. So if you have used CMIG settings with Visual Studio, this file is kind of similar in spirit. CMIG presets lives at the root of the project and is intended to be checked into source control but it also has a companion CMake user presets.json that's intended for developers to save their own local builds and should be excluded from source control. And I'm gonna dive right in and show you what an example configure preset might look like. So this is a single configure preset, which maps to a single CMake invocation, but your CMake presets file can contain any number of configure presets. At the top, I have a unique name and a description. I'm setting my generator, and the vast majority of these fields map directly to command line options that you would pass to CMake when invoking CMake from the command line. So specifying my generator is the same as passing dash G from the command line. Preset support inheritance. So here I am inheriting from another configure preset with the name of base in my CMake presets file. I'm setting my architecture, which is the same as passing dash A from the command line. And I'll be talking more about this uh, in my first demo. Finally, I am setting a few CMake variables. So everything in this cache variables object is equivalent to passing a variable with dash G from the command line. In CMake 320, our team at Microsoft worked really closely with Kitware to contribute support for build and test presets. So as of CMake 320, there are three kinds of presets that are supported in your file. There's configure presets, which I just showed, build presets, and test presets. Just like configure presets, build and test presets allow users to specify common build and test options and share them with others. And again, the vast majority of these fields map directly to command line options. So you can specify things like parallel jobs, native build tool options, test output options for C test, things like that. And again, this is one example build preset that maps to one CMake build invocation, so CMake dash dash build, but your CMake presets file can contain any number of build presets. So again, I have a unique name and a description. Build presets also support inheritance. So here I'm inheriting from another build preset uh, with the name core build. There is a one-to-many mapping between configure presets and build and test presets. And the build directory is inferred from the specified configure preset. So here, the specified configure preset is named x86 windows. You can optionally inherit any environment variables that are set in the specified configure preset, and this normally defaults to true. And you can also specify command line options. So setting clean first to true is the same as passing dash dash clean first from the command line. So far you might be thinking, great, this is yet another JSON file where I can specify my CMake configuration and build options. But on the tooling side of things, our team is actively working to support CMake presets in both Visual Studio and the CMake tools extension in Visual Studio Code. This will allow you to use the same CMake presets.json file to configure and build in Visual Studio, in Visual Studio Code, from the command line, and in your continuous integration pipeline. And we've been careful to make sure that everything that impacts the construction of the CMIT command line is captured in the configure presets, build presets, and test presets that CMIT itself understands. I'm going to be talking about this more in my first demo, but for now, I'm going to jump on into the second section of slides, which is on dependency management. And this time, I'm going to start with the problems. Dependency management is a pain point for all C++ developers, unless you're part of a lucky 14.9% who say it's not a significant issue for me. But there's some problems that might be exasperated for cross-platform developers. 
If I'm building a library from source, then I'm going to need to follow the instructions in the repositories readme, as well as manually fetch and resolve all transitive dependencies, including, the, including installing the right version of those dependencies to not break my dependency tree on all the different platforms that I'm working on. So any lack of automatic and reproducible dependency installation can quickly compound. You might be maintaining multiple sources of truth of your dependency tree across those different platforms. And depending on what tool or tools you're using to help with your workflow, if the tool itself is not cross-platform, then you might be using different workflows on different platforms. But again, fortunately, there are a lot of solutions available to help you. System package managers can be great for installing tooling, but they can make your life difficult when you're trying to install packages. They oftentimes don't have the most up-to-date version of a package installed, and they can also silently update things from underneath you with no warning. So for example, you might pull in a new dependency that updates the version of several dependencies downstream in its own dependency tree with no warning. They are also system-wide and not project-specific, which can make it nearly impossible to work on two different projects with incompatible requirements on the same system. And finally, they are platform specific and oftentimes distro specific. So for example, apt is really popular, but it only works on Debian based Linux systems. Another class of dependency management solutions are build system specific package managers. And the primary example that I'm thinking of here is NuGet. NuGet is not our recommendation for cross platform development or for any C++ development. NuGet does do some nice things, like it offers some build system and IDE integration, and it provides a way to share pre-built binaries. But at the end of the day, NuGet's mission is to be an excellent package manager for MS Build and .NET. And .NET developers have an entirely different set of needs than C++ developers. For example, we generally don't recommend binary-based distribution systems as opposed to source-based distribution systems for C++ development due to ABI incompatibilities. Finally, there are language-specific package managers, which is our recommendation for C++ cross-platform development. Two example of C++ package managers that are being actively invested in are Conan and VC package. And this list of qualities applies to both of those tools. So both Conan and VC package are themselves cross-platform and allow you to bring down and build libraries from source on Windows, Linux, and Mac. They'll both uh, automatically fetch and resolve transitive dependencies for you. Both Conan and VC package support binary caching, which speeds up the amount of time that it takes to download and install libraries on multiple systems. And it also guarantees that all the developers on your team, as well as your CI system, are all using the same version of a library built the same way. Both Conan and VC package support a declarative manifest file where you can declaratively specify your dependencies one time and then check that file into source control. Both Conan and VC package allow you to install libraries from multiple sources, which means that you can use the same tool with both your open source libraries as well as your proprietary libraries and your custom forks of open source libraries. And both Conan and VC package support versioning, which is the ability to specify a specific version of a library that you want to install. Binary caching, manifest support, registry support, which is what VC package calls the ability to install libraries from multiple sources, and versioning support are all new in VC package, which is the tool that my team works on, and they can all be enabled by setting a environment variable. And with that, I'm ready to jump on into my first demo. So here I have a CMake project open in Visual Studio with CMake presets integration enabled. Fair warning that this build is still in development, so everything that I'm showing you today may not ship in this exact form. 
CMake presets will be a recommended and orthogonal alternative to configuring with CMake settings. So there will never be a case where Visual Studio is trying to read from both of those configuration files at the same time. And right now, I'm only using cmakepresets.json. Across my main toolbar, you'll see that I now have three dropdowns. The one on the far left is my active target system. And that's the system where CMake will be called to configure and build the project. Right now, my options are my local machine, a remote connection that I've added in the connection manager, and two WSL distributions that Visual Studio has automatically picked up on. This middle dropdown is my active configure preset, and Visual Studio is surfacing all of the configure presets that apply to the active target system. So with a WSL distro as my active target system, I'm seeing two Linux specific configure presets. But if I were to make my local machine my active system, then I would see two Windows specific configure presets. And I'll be talking more about that relationship in just a few minutes. The third dropdown is my active build preset. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a one-to-many mapping between configure presets and build presets. So Visual Studio will know exactly which build presets apply to this selected configure preset. So now I'm going to open my CMake presets file and walk through how I've configured a few things. So you'll notice right away that Visual Studio has added IntelliSense for this file. So I will see descriptions and types on hover, and I can also get IntelliSense suggestions. This is my array of configure presets, which contains any number of configure presets. And there's three that I want to discuss with you. So this first one I have named base. And because preset support inheritance, there is this optional Boolean called hidden that when true means you can't invoke the preset from the command line and Visual Studio will also not surface it as a valid option. And hidden presets are intended to be parents in an inheritance tree. So I'm using this hidden tree hidden preset to set a few fields that I want to apply to all the rest of my configure presets. So I'm setting my generator, my build and install directory, and I'm enabling VC package integration by passing the VC package toolchain file to CMake and setting a few environment variables to enable new VC package features. My second configure preset is named x86 windows and it is inheriting from my base preset that I just showed you. It's also setting the x86 target architecture. And you'll notice this new architecture strategy key. And that's something that Kitware added with CMake presets. And I'm going to hover and just read the description that comes straight from Kitware. So strategy is an optional string telling CMake how to handle the field. Valid values are set, which sets the respective value. This will result in an error for generators that do not support the respective field. Or I can set it to external, which does not set the value, even if the generator supports it. This is useful if, for example, a preset uses the Ninja generator and an IDE knows how to set up the Visual C++ environment from the architecture and toolset fields. In that case, CMake will ignore the field, but the IDE can use them to set up the environment before invoking CMake. So that's pretty much exactly what's happening in this case. Normally when you're using a command line generator like Ninja, it is your responsibility to source the environment before you invoke CMake, but tools like Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code can help you do that. So by setting architecture strategy to external, I'm telling CMake to not throw an error such that Visual Studio can interpret that field. I also wanted to discuss these vendor objects. So uh, CMake presets allows for vendor objects either per file or per preset, and Microsoft maintains two vendor objects per configure preset. Nothing in these vendor objects impact the construction of the CMake command line, but there are some settings that have to do with IDE integration, like some IntelliSense settings, code analysis settings, and this host OS array. 
So in this host OS array, you can specify the platforms that the configure preset applies to. And we added this because we found that in practice, it's not uncommon for configure presets to become platform specific. Maybe it's through platform specific generators, compilers, full paths, environment variables, anything at all. So if that applies to you, then you can use this array to specify the supported operating systems such that Visual Studio can hide the configure presets that don't apply to the selected target system. If this doesn't apply to you and your configure presets are all platform agnostic, then you can either specify Windows, Linux, and Mac in this array, or you can delete the key entirely, which means that Visual Studio will always surface the configure preset as a valid option. Finally, I have this ARM64 Windows configure preset, which inherits everything from the x86 Windows preset that I just showed you, except it's overriding the architecture to specify ARM64. I have a couple other configure presets here. I have an array of build presets uh, that follows a similar pattern. So I have a hidden core build that's inherited by my other build presets. The one I'm going to be using today is this verbose build. And I have an array of test presets, but I'm not going to walk through those in too much detail in my demo today. But this entire code base, including the CMIC presets file, will be checked in for you to take a closer look at after the talk, or I'm happy to chat more during the Q&A. Two more things that I want to call out before I get out of this file. One, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Visual Studio has added IntelliSense for this file. So you'll get IntelliSense for your configure, build, and test presets for the Microsoft vendor objects. But we've also added IntelliSense for a few additional cache variables. So this, these are variables that we think are commonly modified. So for things like toolchain file, install prefix, and build type, you'll get IntelliSense for those as well, even though they're not officially part of the schema. And lastly, at the top, you can see that I'm specifying a minimum required CMake version. And if you're invoking CMake directly, either from the command line or in a continuous integration system, then you will need to use CMake 320 or later because that's when support for build and test presets was added. But Kitware's recommendation for IDEs is for them to parse CMake presets themselves and construct the command line. And that's what Visual Studio is doing. So because of that, if you're using presets just in Visual Studio, then you don't, we don't actually have a dependency on CMake 320 because uh, Visual Studio is recreating that command line for you. All right, that was a lot of information. But with that, I'm ready to... Um, configure my project. I want the verbose build. So I'll generate the cache, which is the same as invoking CMake configure from the command line. In my demo, I'm only using a CMake presets file, but these two dropdowns for configure and build presets will show the union of non-hidden presets in both CMake presets.json and CMake user presets.json. All right, and it looks like configuration has finished and it's failed because I'm missing a dependency. CMake cannot find LAD. So I'll go over to my vcpackage.json file. And because one, I have this vcpackage.json adjacent to my root CMake list, and two, I'm passing the vcpackage toolchain file to CMake, then when CMake is called to configure the project, VC package will automatically bring down and build all of the dependencies that I've listed here from source, or will download them if I'm using binary caching and install them in a subdirectory of this project's output directory. So all I need to do to add the missing dependency is add glad to this list. There's a few more things I wanna call out about this file. So all the dependencies that I'm pulling in here are open source with the exception of bay code. So I'm gonna go over to my VC package configuration file. And here you can see that I've defined two registries. I have the built-in registry, which is the open source catalog of packages that VC package maintains. 
and I have a custom Git registry. Because the built-in registry is my default registry, that any packages that aren't explicitly specified as coming from a registry will be installed from the default registry. So in my case, only Bay code will be coming in from my Git registry and all of the other open source dependencies will be installed from the built-in registry. Both the built-in registry and the Git registry support a baseline field, which is a Git commit hash and tells VC package to look for the most recent version of all of the packages that it's installing at that specific moment in time. And that's a really easy way to freeze the version of all of your dependencies and also to upgrade the version of all of your dependencies at the same time. If you need more control over the versions of libraries that VC package is installing, there's a couple of options available for you. If you want to set a higher minimum requirement than what your baseline provides, you can use something called a constraint. And that's what I'm doing here with gtest. So here I'm specifying that the version of gtest must be greater or equal to 1.10, even if that's a higher minimum version requirement than what's specified by my baseline. On the flip side of things, if I want to specify a lower minimum requirement than what the baseline provides, I can use something called an override. And overrides are a bit more forceful than constraints. They trump all the other logic that VC package uses when determining versions. And they basically tell VC package that you must use this specific version of this library. So here I'm telling VC package that you must use version 3.3.2 when you're bringing down GLFW. Um, and overrides are most commonly used to set a lower minimum requirement than what a baseline specifies. So now that I have added GLAD, I am ready to reconfigure the project. For more information on registry support, versioning support, or anything that I just talked about, uh, you can check out the C++ team blog. And the blog post, blog post on registries also has instructions for setting up your own Git registry, setting up port files, things like that. All right, so it looks like generation has finished, but this time it was successful. So it looks like VC package is pulling down three libraries, GLAD and its two dependencies, because, because those are the only three packages that weren't successfully installed last time that I invoked configure. You can also see that this entire operation took a suspiciously short amount of time, and that's because I'm using VC package binary caching. So you can see in the output that VC package is attempting to fetch and successfully restoring three packages from NuGet. And there's four different backends that you can use for binary caching. You can use a file share, you can use uh, Azure storage, you can use Google Cloud, or you can use NuGet, which is essentially uploads libraries as raw NuGet files and enables you to use any binary hosting service that already supports NuGet. So for example, I'm using GitHub packages to host these binaries. So because I'm using binary caching, all of these operations are completing in 153 milliseconds, all under a second, and the entire operation took just over five seconds. All right, so now that my build tree has been generated successfully, I can build and run this samples executable on Windows. So this is just a samples executable with a GUI that was included with the static library. And this is samples. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start making some edits to my CMake scripts. So I'm going to switch into CMake targets view, which is a more CMake centric way of viewing my project organized by target. So I can view my targets, references between targets, and just get a better feel for the structure of my project. I'm going to open the CMake script that defines the samples executable. 
And as I mentioned earlier, one of the problems that we would hear from cross-platform developers is that it can be difficult to learn the language of the build system. So there are two features that we added about a year ago now to help try and address this. So first, we added language services for CMake. So now, just like when you're working with C++ source files, I can right-click on a variable and peak definition. So here I'm seeing this sample source files variable defined for me. And I can also right-click on a target and find all references. So this is showing all of the times that this box 2D light target is referenced in my entire project cone. We also added something called project manipulation support. So now let's pretend that I want to add a new test to my test executable. So here is a CMake list that defines my test executable and I will right click on the executable on the target, add new item. I want to add a new source file and I'll just call it new test.cpp. Now, instead of just dropping that file on disk, Visual Studio will try to understand where it might add a reference to that newly added source file. And if there's any ambiguity, then Visual Studio will prompt you with multiple options for you to review and approve. So here you can see it's offering to add the reference straight to this add executable command or to this set command. And because I'm using the test source files variable to define all of my source files, that is the only option that I would want to select. But I don't actually want to do that right now, so I'll cancel out of here. The last thing that I want to do from inside of Visual Studio in this demo is commit the changes that we made to vcpackage.json and push them to the remote to automatically kick off a CI pipeline that I'll be walking through in my second demo. So I'll go to git commit. I just want to add vcpackage.json. We added glad as a dependency commit those changes and push them to the remote. And of course you can use the command line for this workflow as well, but Visual Studio does have Git integration if you prefer having things in the same context. The last thing that I'm going to show you in this first demo is how to reproduce the build that Visual Studio is driving from outside of Visual Studio from the command line. So this is the output directory that Visual Studio's configuration and build created. So in this x86 Windows directory, it's all the build system files that were generated by CMake for the x86 Windows preset. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that entire directory. I'll open up the Windows terminal. And here I am <clears throat> working in the root of my project. So you can see my root CMake list, my CMake presets file, vcpackage.json file. I am working with CMake 320, the first release candidate. And again, you need to use CMake 320 or later if you're invoking CMake directly because that's when support for build and test presets were added. I can see all of the configure build and test presets that are non-hidden and defined in my CMake presets file. And now I'm almost ready to invoke CMake to configure the project, but there is one extra step that I need to take. So as I mentioned earlier, because I'm using a command line generator like Ninja, um, then it becomes my responsibility to source the environment before I invoke CMake. And Visual Studio will do that for me, but since I'm working from the command line, I'll need to take that step myself. But luckily that's very easy to do. So Visual Studio build tools come installed with a batch file that can be used to initialize the environment. And the only argument that you need to pass it is your architecture. So in this case, because I'm targeting x86, I just need to specify x86 as an argument. And now my environment is initialized for x86 and I'm ready to invoke CMake. And this is pretty much as hard as it gets because if you're using an IDE generator, like the Visual Studio generator on Windows, then a lot of that uh, responsibility is abdicated to MS Build. 
And if you're using a command line generator like Ninja on Linux, then CMake can usually resolve everything uh, without you needing to source the environment. So now that my environment is ready, I can invoke CMake by calling CMake dash dash preset and then the name of my configure preset. And um, here we're seeing the same output that we are seeing from inside Visual Studio when I would run generate cache. So you can see the CMake variables that are set in the active configure preset, the environment variables. You can see that VC package is attempting to fetch seven packages from NuGet for the x86 Windows triplet. And that operation completed successfully. Uh, seven packages were restored from NuGet. And configuration has completed successfully. All the build files have been written back to that directory that I uh, removed a few moments ago. Now to build, I can run cmake dash dash build dash dash preset and the name of my build preset. So in this case, I'm using the verbose build, which is passing dash V as a native build tool option to Ninja. And here you can see the verbose build output as I build all of my targets. And together, those two steps replicate the CMake configure and the CMake build step that you can take from inside Visual Studio. And with that, I'm ready to hop back on over to the slides. All right, so to quickly recap what I just showed in my first demo, I showed some preview bits of CMake presets integration in Visual Studio. I showed some new VC package features like the manifest file, registry support, which allowed me to pull down libraries from my Git registry, versioning support with constraints and overrides, and binary caching with my binaries hosted in GitHub packages. I showed both CMake language services and project manipulation support. And at the end, I showed how to reproduce the configure and build actions taken by Visual Studio outside of Visual Studio from the command line. Hi, everyone. So I wanted to answer a few or the question that has come in so far live. So the question was, can cache variables use variable expansion? And the answer is yes, that the cache variables object in a configure preset does support some variable expansion. The ENV operator is supported to reference environment variables. And there's also a series of supported macros that CMIC itself supports. So things like source directory, preset name, um, generator, things like that are supported as well with the same syntax. And I can post a link to that section of Kitworth's documentation in the chat for you to take a further look at. Um, if there's any more questions, feel free to keep posting them in the chat, and then I can either answer in line if it's just a short answer, or I will answer it live um, throughout the rest of the presentation, or we can have a Q&A at the end. All right, thank you. I will go resume the video now. Now we're ready to discuss the third section, which is debugging. And again, I'm going to start with the problems. One thing that I hear repeatedly from cross-platform developers is that they are unfamiliar with platform-specific tools. This might be especially true if you added support for a second platform after your project had already existed for a while. So for example, you might have worked primarily on Windows and relied on the Visual Studio debugger, but now you want to support Linux as well. A common theme that I hear in response to this problem is that teams will have a few Linux devs who are comfortable using GDB from the command line and become responsible for debugging all Linux failures. Another source of tension is if and when to use a graphical interface versus a command-driven interface when debugging. Command line tools are perfectly fine, but there might be some times when you or others on your team would prefer a graphical interface. Maybe it's to see breakpoints highlighted, or maybe it's to keep both the watches and locals windows open simultaneously and in the same visual location as you step through your code, instead of having to request that information on each step or scroll up and down in your terminal. There can also be a higher learning curve for command line tools which again is perfectly fine, 
but it can help lead to some unbalanced solutions, like only a subset of your team being able to debug all Linux failures. We also know that some developers will hop between platforms to work natively on that platform daily or weekly whenever they're dealing with platform specific issues. And again, this is perfectly fine, but it can be kind of unproductive. Finally, we know debugging tests that crash in a continuous integration pipeline can be a pain, especially if you don't normally test locally and you rely on your CI system to catch runtime errors. But again, there are a host of solutions available to help make your life easier. One class of solutions are cross-platform IDEs and editors, and these tools run natively on Windows, Linux, and Mac. A few examples are CLiant, VS Code, and Qt Creator. And these tools can help provide a consistent user experience when you're working on different platforms, but they don't necessarily help to address the problem of having to switch between platforms to work natively when debugging a platform-specific issue. A second class of solutions is remote debugging, which we can define as debugging a program running on a different system and likely a different operating system or architecture than the one you are working on. And there's a few examples of this. One is the three VS Code remote extensions. So there's the SSH extension, the WSL extension, and the Docker extension. Another example is Visual Studio's remote support, and Visual Studio allows you to debug using the front end of the Visual Studio debugger backed by either GDB or GDB server on WSL or on a remote system. And CLine and Qt Creator also offer remote debugging solutions when debugging on remote systems and WSL. Finally, another tool in your toolkit can be core dump debugging. And this is helpful when maybe a test crashes and you can't reproduce the crash locally, or maybe you're working on a service and you deployed your service and there's some crash that your test didn't catch, then that's a great time to turn to core dump debugging. So with that, I'm ready to hop on into my second demo. So now I'm back in Visual Studio, and this time I'm going to be working with my ARM64 Windows configure preset. So I will start configuring that. Visual Studio offers support for building and debugging on WSL and on remote Linux systems, which is something that I've shown in previous demos, and I'm happy to chat about more in the Q&A today. But today, I'm going to be showing our support for ARM64 Windows development in CMake projects. So it looks like generation has finished. So now when I select my sample, my second sample is executable. This one doesn't have a GUI to build and run. Then what Visual Studio is doing is cross-compiling the executable locally on my host system for ARM64 Windows and then deploying the executable along with the ARM64 version of the VC runtime libraries and the universal CRT to my ARM64 Windows VM that I have running right now. The only thing I need installed on that VM is the Visual Studio remote debugging tools, so I don't need any build tools or Visual Studio or SSH installed on that Windows VM. So when I open that ARM64 VM, I can see that the executable has been launched. I can interact with it. And from Visual Studio, I can debug like normal. So I've hit my breakpoint. I can inspect variables. I have a visual call stack. I can step into this length function, step out of it and step through my code as expected. To configure this remote debugging se session, you can go to debug, debug and launch settings for your active target, which in my case is this samples no GUI. Here I am working with a remote Windows configuration and the only uh, modification that I needed to make to this file was to specify the name or IP address of the remote server. 
One thing that I want to call out is that when you're building and debugging on a remote Linux system, you first need to add an SSH connection to that system in the connection manager. And when you're debugging on a remote Windows system, you don't need to take that step. And that's because Visual Studio is not communicating over SSH. It can rely entirely on the Visual Studio remote debugging tools that are installed on the remote Windows machine. And today I'm using an ARM64 Windows VM, but the same workflow can apply to a Windows VM of any architecture. So that wraps up the ARM64 demo, and now you can use Visual Studio CMake projects to build and debug locally on WSL or Linux and on Windows VMs. All right, so with that, I'm now going to hop on over to GitHub so we can take a look at the CI workflow that I kicked off at the end of my first demo. So here is my most recent workflow. It succeeded and you can see that I had two jobs, one on Windows and one on Ubuntu. And because I already walked through how you can invoke CMake to configure and build with presets from the Windows command line, I'm only going to walk through the Ubuntu job but again, this entire code base, including the YAML file that I used to configure this GitHub Actions workflow, will be checked in for you to take a closer look at. So here I am acquiring VC package, acquiring CMake 320. I'm setting up my NuGet credentials because I'm using NuGet as the backend for VC package binary caching to host my binaries and GitHub packages. This action that I'm invoking here is used to source the environment when I'm building with Ninja in the Windows job, but because this is a Linux job, there is no work to be done. And then this step here, configure and build on Linux, is really where the bulk of the work is happening. So you can see that I am invoking CMake to configure and build using the same syntax that I used when I was working from the Windows command line. So I'm passing a configure preset and a build preset. So this again is the same output that we have been seeing. So VC package is attempting to and successfully restoring seven packages from NuGet, which is that means I'm pulling from the same place no matter where I'm building. So that is success successful operation and generation complete successfully. And then build is invoked. And so here is my clean build that completes successfully. The last thing that I'm doing in this workflow is I am invoking ctest with a test preset. And that's done with this ctest dash dash preset and then pass in the name of a test preset. And you can see that all nine of my tests are being called and are passing successfully. If I scroll up and go back to this code tab, then the last thing I want to show you is the actual uh, binaries that are hosted in GitHub packages. So here you can see the x86 Windows triplets, the x64 Linux triplets, and down at the bottom, the ARM64 Windows triplets of all the different libraries that I am using for this sample project, including this one that's coming from my custom Git registry that's not open source. All right, so in this example, all of my tests were passing, but there might be a scenario where I have a test that failed that I can't reproduce that crash, or a test that crashed and I can't reproduce that crash locally, or as I mentioned earlier, maybe I'm working on a service and my service crashed in some way that I can't reproduce. In that instance, you might want to try debugging, a, taking and debugging a core dump. And we recently added support for debugging Linux core dumps directly from Visual Studio. So I'm gonna open up Visual Studio again. And this time I am working with a release build that's available for you to download today. So there's no CMake presets integration. To get started debugging a Linux core dump, you can go to debug, other debug targets, debug Linux core dump. And I want to underscore that you don't need to be using CMake or building with Visual Studio at all in order to use this functionality. 
the only information that Visual Studio needs to start debugging the core dump is the system where you want to be debugging. So that can either be WSL or some remote Linux system uh, where you've added a connection in the connection manager. The Linux path to the core file, the Linux path to the binary, and if you want source level debugging, then you will need a list of source mappings that match your sources from your Linux system to your sources on the Windows system. Um, but again, you don't need to be using CMake or anything that I've shown earlier. So if you're using Visual Studio Solutions to build on Windows and maybe you use a make file or something to build on Linux, that's perfectly fine. You can still use this functionality to debug your Linux core dump with the front end of the Visual Studio debugger. So when I click debug, Visual Studio will start debugging this core dump file using the front end of the Visual Studio debugger backed by GDB. So here I can see, uh, again, I can inspect variables. I have a nice visual call stack. And in this case, maybe my cat walked over my keyboard or something because this is just supposed to be three and not three million. So no matter what your cross-platform workflow building locally is, this is a tool that you can use when you want to debug a Linux core dump with the familiar Visual Studio debugger. And with that, we can jump back on over to my slides. To recap what I showed in the second demo, I showed remote debugging of a CMake project on an ARM64 Windows VM from Visual Studio, where Visual Studio will automatically deploy the binary along with the ARM64 version of the VC runtime libraries and the universal CRT for easy debugging. I showed a GitHub Actions pipeline where I acquired CMake and VC package, downloaded cache binaries from GitHub packages, configure, built, and ran my full suite of tests using CMakePresets.json on both Windows and Linux. And again, the YAML file that I used to configure that GitHub Actions workflow will be checked in for you to take a closer look at after the talk. And finally, I showed how you can debug Linux core dumps from Visual Studio on WSL. And for more information on what that workflow might look like for your team, you can check out a blog post that the team at Blizzard working on Diablo 4 published recently to the C++ team blog. That's kind of a case study and gives some ideas on how the feature might complement your existing workflows. To wrap things up, I hope that you enjoyed this talk. I hope that you maybe gain some new awareness of all of the tools and new developments that are available to help make your cross-platform workflows easier. I hope you realize that while some of your team's problems might be completely unique, there might be some problems that are shared among other teams that are doing cross-platform development. And for those shared problems, we can leverage shared solutions. I hope you'll talk to us, talk to me, other folks on my team, other teams that are working on cross-platform tooling, because we work on this tooling because we want it to make your life easier. And we're constantly iterating over our tools to make sure that they're solving real problems. Again, the code base that I was working with today uh, will be checked in for you to take a look at. Today, I was working with a private fork because the GitHub packages are private, um, but everything will be available here. And finally, I would encourage you to take a look at the C++ team blog. That's the best place to stay up to date with recent developments. So I'll be posting there when CMake presets integration in both Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code is available for you to try. There are blog posts on new VC package developments. And overall, it's the best place to uh, stay up to date with what our team is working on. All right, thank you everyone, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of ACCU.